Good evening. So I love Bostonese after spending four years in undergrad in that fine city. Like any good immersion in a foreign language, I came away with a firm handle on all the curse words. But I'll just start tonight by saying, hi, how are ya? <laughs> I am thrilled to welcome AIJ Boston's fellow, Elizabeth Resnick. The Fellow Award is a peer honor bestowed upon designers who have made a significant contribution to raising the standards of excellence within their design community. AIJ Colorado also honors our community members with the Fellow Award, and this spring on May 19th, we'll be celebra celebrating two new fellows, so save the date for a garden party to celebrate these designers and our design community. Speaking of community, there are many of us in this room tonight that takes elevating design seriously for aspiring designers, be it mentors or educators. It's important work to connect, engage, and push young designers, and I want to thank all of you in this room this evening. Young designers, you've been given an opportunity this year to engage with public discourse in an unprecedented way. And I encourage you to be inspired and also to be inspiring. For more inspiration, we have a series of events designed to help you push the boundaries. Thursday, March 2nd, on Auraria campus, we have a student event for uh, students and emerging designers, and we'll have a show and tell from six local companies who understand that being unique is how we survive in our industry. Alternatively, come to the first Friday event at Inc. Lounge to meet these makers. And then on Saturday the 4th, um, these companies will open their doors for a studio tour. Of course, more information is online. Thanks to the Denver Art Museum and the Design Council, our sponsors for the evening. And I'd now like to introduce Mike Hayway, our speaker series chair. Good evening. Um, before we get started, as you came in, you got a little raffle, well, a little ticket. That will be for a raffle at the end of the evening um, for we're auctioning, or well, raffling off two of Elizabeth's books here. Our speaker tonight is an accomplished design professional. Elizabeth Resnick is Professor Emerita and now part-time faculty at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston. Over the years, she has been an active AIGA member, working with AIGA National on the Design Education Steering Committee from 2003 to 2005, and then was honored, as noted, in 2007 with the AIGA Boston Fellows Award for her contributions to the community. Professor Resnick has also curated seven comprehensive design exhibitions, most with curator, co-curators. She has published associated catalogs for those exhibitions, and the list is diverse. Russell Mills, Within Without in 1991, Dutch Graphic Design, 1918 to 1945 in 1994, Makoto Saito, Art of the Poster in 1999, The Graphic Imperative, International Posters of Peace, Social Justice, and the Environment in 2005, um, Graphic Intervention, 25 Years of International AIDS Awareness Posters, from 1985 to 2010, in 2010. Graphic Advocacy, International Posters for the Digital Age, 2001 to 2012, in 2012. And Women's Rights Are Human Rights, International Posters on Gender-Based Inequality, Violence, and Discrimination, in 2016. In addition, Professor Resnick is a published author, uh, having most recently completed her book, Developing Citizen Designers, which we'll be uh, giving two of away tonight. Um, so that was in 2016, and her other books include Design for Communication, Conceptual Graphic Design Basics, and Graphic Design, A Problem-Solving Approach to Visual Communication. She's currently working on a new book, The Social Design Reader, which is due out in 2019. And it is with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Resnick. Wow, that was exhausting. <laughs> Sorry. Did I really do all that? OK, so let me just see if there's going to be a slide. Oh, OK. Don't look. Right. 
don't need it. Ah, good. Um, so I'm very honored to be here tonight. Um, as you probably have guessed, I am an AIJ junkie. I um, started very early on in my career uh, volunteering in the Boston chapter, and I was very active in the chapter because I found that in order to bring inspiring ideas into our town, um, you had to become involved and you had to volunteer and you had to make these things happen. So um, I saw that direct correlation between bringing in speakers and my role at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, which is a state school. It's the only public college of art and design in the country, which equals no money. So we didn't have money to bring in uh, speakers, so I used AIJ as our kind of guest speaker program. And so it worked out really well. What I would like to do tonight is to share with you my journey. I think it's really important um, for people to realize that, you know, your early years and what you've been exposed to, and most especially the time in which you live, has great effect to the kind of work that you start to undertake. And as your life and your career continue on, you know, the paths that you take. So in my presentation, I'm going to share with you my story, and hopefully, um, if you have any questions at the end, please ask them, because sometimes um, I, I talk a lot better. <laughs> I'm scripted, I'm an academic, and so I want to make sure I say everything I need to say, okay? I am a child of my times. I have been profoundly influenced and shaped by the time period in which I have lived. Each of us, in our own individual way, are part of a much larger societal structure. It's not advancing. Sorry. Is it stuck? Oh, interesting. That works. Maybe. So, continue to go forward. Let me see. Yep, okay, I'm go. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is very human to think of ourselves as completely unique, in reality, few of us have been raised in a vacuum, untouched by the course of our history or culture. I am a baby boomer. And most of you probably know, baby boomer is the descriptive term for Americans born between 1946 and 1964. After World War II ended, 12 million American servicemen and servicewomen returned home to resume their lives as civilians. Some would be reunited with spouses and children, others to fiancés, boyfriends, or girlfriends, Many had someone special during their service activities to return to. These relationships, which were fueled by common traditional values, led to marriage and family production, which secured the American way of life with its dreams of prosperity during this very hopeful time. A post-war euphoria would create a generation of almost 76 million boys and girls, one baby every eight seconds for 18 years. The 1950s and early 1960s were years of exceptional economic growth, fueled in great measure by the emergence of the baby boom generation and the subsequent growth of the new markets to serve a child-centered nation. My parents were married in 1946. They met at a Saturday night dance in Brooklyn, New York during the war years. I was born in 1948. Baby boomers were the children of a new emerging middle class and boomers came of age during the 1950s and 60s when racial segregation was legal, interracial marriages were taboo, and blacks and other minorities were marginalized and living on the fringes of American society. Women suffered the same fate as minorities and were victims of discrimination routinely stereotyped in the job market and sharply limited in their opportunities for higher education. Baby boomers were angered by what they perceived as senseless injustices 
and unfair treatment to minorities. They rejected their parents' conservative and consumer-driven dri lives by challenging societal standards towards sex, drugs, music, politics, and the acquisition of wealth. They became social cause oriented by embracing multiculturalism and diversity. They protested for equal rights for women. They protested for civil rights and independence from oppression for racial minorities. And they protested to bring attention to the practice of racial, gender, and age discrimination in the workplace and to end police brutality. They actively protested against the tyranny and injustice of a war where thousands of young American men were routinely and unfairly drafted into military service, many against their will. During this turbulent time, my family lived in Queens, a suburb of New York City. I was 15 in the fall of 1963 when I entered the High School of Art and Design. Art and Design is one of a select group of New York City specialty high schools where applicants must take an entrance exam and present a portfolio to be accepted. Even in those days, that, was, um, the, that picture was taken of me when I entered a sweatshirt competition for a radio show. And I was, as you could see, an early feminist. They were the good guys. That was what they called themselves. I studied fashion illustration and advertising art along with a full course load of academic subjects required to earn my high school diploma. Unfortunately, much of the work I did as a teenager was lost, but the ink drawings I made for the French American student newspaper survived in my scrapbook. Also, this fashion illustration I had drawn from a photograph. In the 1960s, there was a strict dress code for young women. We wore dresses or skirts, silk stockings, and small heeled shoes to school. Fashion dictated that we wore lots of heavy eye makeup and styled our hair into towering bouffant hairdos. In early 1964, the Beatles arrived in New York, bringing with them a wave of British contemporary fashion styles like miniskirts, go-go boots, and hip-hugger pants, and long, straight hairstyles. The 1960s were truly synonymous with new, exciting, radical, subversive events, and I felt like I lived in the epicenter. Although I was accepted at Pratt Institute, I knew it would be best for me to attend an art college away from my New York-based family. I decided to enroll at Rhode Island School of Design at a time when RISD was a very small art college in Providence, Rhode Island. My, my parents thought I was crazy, leaving the hub of the universe to go to Providence. Here we dressed very informally, bell-bottom jeans again, turtleneck t-shirts, and what would have been an idyllic existence for this young, talented student body was actually a time fraught with fear and anxiety. Young men, our boyfriends, brothers, cousins, neighbors, were pursued relentlessly by their local draft boards to enlist for military service. Too many of these young innocents sent off to war returned home in caskets. Young women were exempt from military service because of their female sex, although numbers of brave young women did enlist in the military to serve their country in supporting roles as military administration or in the field as nurses. As a stark contrast to this volatile political atmosphere played out daily on the nightly news, my undergraduate years as a graphic design major focused on learning reductive, modernist, formal vocabularies, ideally suited to the needs of corporate business and advertising environments. My parents had anticipated I would return home after college to work as a creative in one of the many New York City advertising agencies. The plan was altered when on the verge of my college graduation in May 1970, the national tragedy at Kent State University happened. On May 4, 1970, 
Ohio National Guardsmen marched onto the campus at Kent State University and fired their weapons into a crowd of unarmed students who were gathered to protest U.S. incursions into Cambodia as a military strategy of the Vietnam War. Thirteen students were shot, four students were killed, nine survived. There was a significant national response to the shootings. Hundreds of universities, colleges, and high schools closed down throughout the United States as four million students went on strike. Art students, myself included, poured into printmaking studios and letterpress labs to produce a multitude of anti-war visual propaganda closely mirroring the activity of the Atelier Populaire in Paris during the student riots of May 1968. At RISD, at the RISD workshops, we created placards for an immediate protest march on the state capitol building in Providence, Rhode Island, and, four day, and five days later, we sent the same materials and more on buses to Washington, D.C., where over 100,000 youthful demonstrators converged to protest the shootings and the continuing war. Caught up in the vortex of this moment of event, I became aware for the very first time in my life how my skills could be put to good use for purposes beyond the promotion or selling of goods and services. For me, a revelation toward a new way of thinking about design. Much of the graphic design work I admired from this time were the anti-war posters. but you have to go on and make a living. Thanks to a recruiting session I attended at RISD in the spring of 1970, I was offered a job at Hallmark Cards in, in Kansas City, Missouri, in their creative lettering department. In those days, there were no computers and graphic designers had to, had to have the ability to draw, and that included drawing letters. Although I lasted only seven months in that very strict corporate environment, I made good future use of the skill set I acquired at Hallmark. I returned to New York City and took a job as an assistant in a two-person design studio, primarily serving the book publishing market. At the studio, I made many book covers, often utilizing my illustrative lettering skills and also modeling fees, as that is also me in the photograph being a liberated woman. <laughs> in the summer of 1972, I wanted to escape New York City, so I accepted a job as a crafts counselor at the Shaker Village Work Group, a teen summer program that occupied historic Shaker land and buildings in New Lebanon, New York. I taught weaving to New York City teenagers on 150-year-old Shaker looms before they were put in museums. That was uh, quite fun. I met my future husband that summer. Victor was hired to teach Shaker folk songs, and that was the whole camp in the camp picture. After the summer, I followed Victor back to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where he lived commune style with other like-minded musicians. I joined the group as their designated graphic designer. You could do that in those days. You didn't need the money. During that time period, I built up my freelance business working for the Animal Rescue League of Boston. I also did ads and other promotions for Store 24. That was a 24-hour convenience store that catered to the counterculture crowd. In the fall of 1977, I was hired by Corning Medical and Scientific, later uh, renamed Corning, uh, Seba Corning Diagnostics Corporation, as a senior design consultant working directly with Robert Potts, then head of design worldwide. I worked for Seba Corning for 20 years, designing packaging, marketing materials, and also um, the signage, not signage, um, the type on, on medical machinery, where it says press here, and whenever there was type, I would design it. 
Also in the fall of 1977, I was hired as a permanent half-time faculty member at what was then known as Massachusetts College of Art. 22 years later, in the fall of 1999, I transitioned into a full-time design educator. In 2001, I became chair of communication design, which was later renamed when they divorced graphic design, illustration, and animation. I was the chair of graphic design. And by 2007, I was a full tenured professor. As a component to my service to the Boston design community, of which you have heard already, <laughs> I served on the AIJ chapter board for many years, organizing and designing events and exhibitions, quite literally too many to mention. And um, one of the great parts about doing that um, during those years was that we had sponsorship of the printing companies and the paper companies, and in those days, of course, the typesetters. So one of the nice parts about actually being able to do a um, event was that we usually got to do the posters, or in some cases, sometimes the speakers would do them. So that was great fun to do. I was also invited to participate in AIGA's 100 Designs for the 100 Years Anniversary Project in, I think it was 2014, and I chose the year 1953, celebrating the coronation of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I remember watching the coronation on, on a little tiny black and white TV when I was five years old. It was one of those memories that were just imprinted on my mind. From 2001 to 2003, I was the art director for Art New England Magazine. And these are just some of the kinds of work. I mean, there were about 36 issues that I art, art directed, but this is kind of what they look like. And I have to say, this is one of my favorite spreads in the world, because this article talked about the big dig in Boston, there was a very large big dig that happened for 20 years, versus this big dig that was happening in Berlin, and they gave me pictures of holes. I mean, I'm dirt and holes and machinery. And um, this is one of the very first time in Art New England magazine, which is just loaded with images, that I got to do a typographic response to the big dig or the big hole. So I was quite pleased by that. I have also maintained a deep, deep love affair with photography throughout my career and had an opportunity to work with the 20 by 24 of which Mass Art had one of five in the world. I have also kept active in the international po um, political poster arena, having posters accepted into both the Mexican Biennale and the Warsaw Biennale. And these are a couple of posters I've done over the last few years. When I trained in graphic design at RISD in the 1960s, designers were essentially servants of business. Designers were given assignments where the content and context was fixed, the copy was written, the designer was challenged to give it form, and basically nothing more. In the mid to late 1970s, I began writing design curriculum that mirrored my interest in advocacy and design authorship. The first book that I um, managed to publish early in the 1980s was my Introduction to Graphic Design course curriculum in the form of a 10-chapter book. Each chapter was an assignment. And um, just to give you an idea, like chapter three were letter form progressions, and chapter nine was the vegetable poster. So a lot of this work, it was very 2D. Um, very typographic and very two-dimensional, 2D design, 2D uh, basically. But the last two assignments were poster assignments, and um, this really became an eye-opener for me. So assignment nine was called the vegetable poster. The goal of this assignment is to encourage children six to nine to eat more vegetables. I have raised two children. I know how hard it is to get them to eat their vegetables. All of the examples you will see in these early posters were made with cut paper and hand lettered with gouache. 
and they're not completely clean because they were rescanned from slides, so I'm sorry, they're not sharp. There were no personal computers at this time. The poster on the left is an example of the power of getting across good messages in a fun and entertaining way. On the right, the student plays on a child's fantasy world where asparagus stalks could become medieval castles. And who wouldn't love this student's sense of humor in depicting sunbathing hot chili peppers? Assignment 10 was called the country poster. I actually did this assignment with Malcolm Greer at RISD, but I gave it a bit of a twist. The challenge here was to have students choose a country and interpret the feeling, design, and color of that country graphically. The only copy to appear on the poster is the name of the country that should be integrated into the larger composition. And here on the left, the country name is Haiti and it's woven into the native's basket. And on the right, the shadows cast from camels crossing the Sahara Desert, spelling out Morocco. But something interesting, interesting happened with this assignment. Students also took the opportunity of making political statements. On the left is a masterful cut paper portrait of labor activist Lex Wałęsa, Poland's solidarity leader who worked to free Poland from communist rule in the 1970s and 80s. The poster on the right was made during Iran's civil war that ended the Shah of Iran's regime. The students could do anything they wanted, so I got really excited when this started to happen, and I encouraged it. On the left, this poster creates a, dyna a dramatic visual demonstration of apartheid in the, in the Republic of South Africa, and on the right is the student's advocacy for the unification of Israel and Palestine. In 2003, I published my second book, a collection of 42 graphic design and typography assignments written by college educators to teach the fundamental design concepts and techniques and richly illustrated with actual student work. One of the big beefs I have generally about um, books that are aimed towards students is most of them contain professional work. And although I think it's really important for students to see professional work, I think it's more challenging for students to see what other students can do and then match their own talents toward it. In chapter six, which I titled Visual Advocacy, I showcased my thinking in creating assignments to challenge design students to think beyond the means or the needs of business and commerce. One assignment was titled Human Rights Advocacy Poster. The students were given a copy of the United Nations 1948 Universal Declaration of uh, Human Rights document and asked to choose one of the rights to visualize in the form of a poster. Here, Rita Ferrara, who was an illegal immigrant at this time, chooses right 16 to comment on illegal Im immigration all people deserve the right to peacefully obtain basic human necessities in times of dire need, including food, water, and basic shelter, even if it violates the law. On the left is right three. All people deserve the right to be free from persecution or discrimination based on any physical feature or quality including race, gender, disability, age, sexual orientation, or any other physical aspect or feature. Um, on the right is also, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a mix up. On the left is right 16, and then on the right is right three. So we have two women in the Garden of Eden. Another assignment I give is titled Designing Dissent Advocacy Poster Series. The students research a topic or issue, determine an appropriate con conceptual direction, and produce three posters in what could be an ongoing series to inform, empower, or educate a target constituency that would benefit most by the message. 
And here the student, these, this was um, this particular one for breast cancer reads, check them, handle them, squeeze them. Colleen Venerable uses humor to encourage women to check their breasts for lumps. This poster series was des uh, designed for placement in subway cars in Boston. Here, my student Erica Sullivan engages parents to remind them that they play a significant role in their child's journey through reading. These posters would be displayed in libraries and schools. If you look at the posters really closely, the parent is always there, either on the shore or participating in some way as the child is having the journey. Jesse Tubero targets young teenagers using comic book heroes that advocate the use of condoms in saving lives. These posters would be seen in community centers and in high schools. My third book, Developing Citizen Designers, was published in 2016. It responds to the rise of the academic debate and teaching in the areas of social design, sustainable design, ethical design, and design futures. Educating young designers today doesn't mean teaching them to become co consummate service providers, consummate service providers. Students want to use their skills for good. They want to develop the tools they need to respond to unforeseen challenges. They want to give back to their world. But how do we teach them to be effective at making social change? The book is divided into three parts, design thinking, design methodology, and making a difference. Each section addresses a particular area or issue within socially conscious design practice. So the, the areas would be socially responsible design, design activism, design authorship, collaborative learning, participatory design, and on the next page, service design. Part three, making a difference, explores different ways of thinking about teaching or manifesting social design pedagogy through thoughtfully written essays. Each section includes a framing essay by a leading design educator, a five question illustrated interview, and a wide range of international case studies and assignments that demonstrate how to put principles into effective learning and practice. So um, here, this is uh, one, of the, one of the framing essays for socially responsible design written by Andrew Shea. Um, whoops. Oh, okay, it got skipped. This is one of the two sp um, several spread case studies. This is what it looked like. This was done by um, a friend, Alice Druding, at Tyler School of Art. They had a bird problem. The birds kept uh, flying into this big plate glass window and breaking their necks. So they had the students, all the students in the sophomore class, design designs that they could actually apply to the windows so that the birds would um, know that there was glass there and stop hitting the glass. And here were some of the... Um, assignments, some of the ones we chose to show. And uh, I am going to talk about just one of the case studies. It's the only one of mine that I did put in the book. And to give you an idea of, of what this is about. So this one of the 42 case studies included in the book is the Family Van, which is a mobile health clinic, a program initiative of Harvard Medical School. And it travels to under serve Boston neighborhoods each week, providing free preventive health care, health education, and referrals for individuals. Jennifer Bennett, Family Van Director, contacted the Center for Art and Community Partnerships at MassArt, whose mission is to match MassArt community with neighborhood organizations to create mutually beneficial, sustainable partnerships in art and design. And in this case, a new van wrap for a mobile health clinic. 
these are all mushed around. I don't know how that happened. But anyway, there's Jennifer talking to my students about um, what a mobile van clinic does. And in the uh, upper left-hand corner is what the van looked like. And um, so the biggest problem with this was that the van scared off the people it meant to serve because it looked very corporate, very sterile, and the neighborhoods that this van services um, are very heavily immigranted neighborhoods. From the, these people are from the Caribbean, um, from Haiti, from Cuba, from Africa, um, and they were too scared. It's free, and they were too scared to go in. So it was clearly off-putting. So on the first day, Jennifer did the presentation on what it is that she was trying to achieve with this with my students. Jennifer uh, was also present for each of the four consecutive weekly class meetings as an active participant in the design process. I think this is one of the most important things that when we bring social design projects into our classrooms, that we have um, the leading stakeholder who is there to not only describe the communities at risk, but also they're there to help the students understand who it is that they are designing for. The students presented their final results in the fourth week. The 14 design, I had 14 students in this particular class. The 14 designs were then taken back to the family van staff office to be shared with the community stakeholders. Now, part of this process was to choose five out of the 14 van wrap designs to undergo community testing. The ultimate goal was to have the local community residents, and in particular, interestingly enough, teenagers, select the new van wrap. They really wanted the teenagers to start to use this uh, service so that they could protect themselves against AIDS, against unwanted pregnancies, and all the other fun stuff that they face. So it went out into the community, and this is how they did it. When the results were tallied, my student Millie Husevas, visual proposal, which incorporated vi vivid colors and imaginative imagery, was favored as the best representation of the family's van mission to, and I quote, increase access to health and improve healthy behaviors by providing culturally and linguistically appropriate health services to the community that it serves. Now, what you're looking at, if you look really closely, on the left is what she did in class. And on the right was when uh, her design was selected. I had said that, you know, they just couldn't keep the design, that, that if they wanted to use her design, A, they needed to ask her permission, of which, of course, she gave her permission, and two, they needed to hire her and pay her $500 to do the production work. And so, of course, as we all know in design, um, a, a large a committee of stakeholders went through the design itself and they took out some of the elements and made it a little bit simpler and also helped her with some of the languages that are spoken in those communities. They're in the curve areas. And that's actually what the family van looks like. It's quite a large van, and it was a huge wrap. And that when this thing goes through the, the uh, streets of Boston, you know it. It's very bright. A good history of design isn't a history of design at all. It's a history of ideas and therefore culture. This notion put forward by the late design provocateur Tibor Kalman in the late 1990s continues to resonate with me today. Graphic design history is about how we have come to know what we believe about design. We learn about known practitioners, their process, and their relationship to their work, and how their artifacts facts fit into a larger cultural context. This knowledge can serve as both a catalyst and a foundation to help us develop our ideas, be inspired, and to come to understand our world. So as a component, um, Mike was so nice to read all of these off. <laughs> as a component of my research, uh, my community-based research, I, I was very fortunate to have seen 
the um, groundbreaking exhibition, some of you may have seen this also in this room, Graphic Design in America, a Visual Language History that was curated by Mildred Friedman and put on display at the Walker Art Center in 1989. And then it traveled to, I believe, four other venues. It actually went to the Phoenix Art Museum. I, don't, I think that was the last place. It went to New York and it went to London. And this is the first time to try to explain what graphic design was to the larger population. I saw this. It was my aha moment. And I realized that as a component of teaching my students, that for them to see uh, work, if you will, in the manner you're seeing this work, you know, either in tiny little uh, il illustrations in books or projected um, on walls, was not really um, good enough for them to get an idea of what kind of power this work had when you actually stood in front of it and interacted with it. So I, I came to this conclusion that of all the delivery systems now available to explore purposeful ideas and artifacts, the exhibition format, Matt, for me, is the most immediate and effective means to tell our stories through a focused viewpoint. Graphic design, in addition to its inherent for formal considerations, is really best scrutinized through the wider lens encompassing culture, commerce, and the developing technologies. Acting on this convi con conviction, I have organized and curated three large graphic design exhibitions during the 1990s, and, and I kind of say, you know, two, I glorified two human beings <laughs> and a time period in Dutch graphic design history, and it was fun. But then I got more involved in messaging, real messaging, messages that I thought that my students needed to see, messages that I think the larger population needs to see and consider. So I started to curate socio-political poster exhibitions or narratives as I've come to think about them from 2005 to 2016. So I'm just gonna take you through these, uh, the poster ones just to kind of introduce you to them and what I was thinking about when I was working on them. So the first one that I did was, gra uh, it was actually called The Graphic Imperative, but I kind of took the the out. So it's Graphic Imperative, International Posters of Peace, Social Justice, and the Environment, 1965 to 2005. At the time that this was um, being uh, discussed, AIGA had decided that their big conference was going to be in Boston in 2005. In the early uh, noughties, in the early 2000s, um, I had a colleague who um, kind of left Zimbabwe because his life was being threatened and came to the United States, Chaz Maviani Davis, and he was an internationally known political poster designer. So when I found out that the conference was coming to Boston, I walked into Chaz's office and I said, okay, this is it. We're going to do this exhibition we've always wanted to do. This is 40 years of international socio-political posters that we've grown up with, that we've come to know, that are many of them in the canons, considered canons of graphic design. And so this particular um, exhibition was put up during the conference and there were 2,500 designers that came into Boston during this conference. And many of them made their way down to Mass Art to see this exhibition. And something um, amazingly phenomenal happened. Graphic designers had been looking for really good shows that they could put in their university galleries. And there weren't that many around. So I started to get many, many requests to have this particular exhibition travel. And it traveled for five years. It hit a chord. So anyway, this is just what it looked like in Philadelphia. And uh, all of my uh, exhibitions have catalogs. This is what the catalog looked like. And then um, after a couple of years of traveling this exhibition and also being invited to many universities to give these particular lectures about um, this particular work, I had people go, oh, okay, Liz, what's next? You know, <laughs> what do you mean, what's next? You know, this is a, like 120 posters. And then um, I realized that a friend of mine had an archive 
of 3,300 AIDS awareness posters that had been collected from around the world, like from little villages in Africa and as well as advertising agencies and such. So he made his archive available to me and we curated, um, I had a, another curator with this, graphic intervention, international posters on AIDS awareness, 1985 to 2010. And this traveled for two years until the archive was bought out, out from under us um, and the whole collection went to the Wolfsonian after it was displayed there. And this is also what it looked like um, on the left for, at Mass Art when it opened and then um, at the Art Directors Club in New York City. Uh, most of my exhibitions have been shown at the Art Directors Club. That's my venue in New York. And this is what the catalog looked like. Amazing work. And um, not, the, one of the nice things about these exhibitions is that I'll often get invited to come and give lectures and interact with students, which I just love. And the last one was graphic advocacy, international posters for the digital age 2001 to 2012. And with this one, I looked at the phenomenon of that um, we no longer actually have to pay for printing of these posters. I mean offset printing post of these posters, because now we can actually have our say about things in the world posted on the internet, and it goes around the world in a nanosecond. So we're not hampered by the fact that we have no money to print the poster. And then even when you have the poster, it's only a small community that actually gets to see it. So um, this particular exhibition was really documenting what was going on uh, which for me really triggers after 9-11 when AIGA uh, emailed its membership right after it had happened and said, this is a horrific act and I know that you need to find some way to be able to, you know, explore your angst and because, you know, writers will write but you'll design. So design something, upload it to the internet those days when little tiny JPEGs took an hour to upload to the internet and uh, AIJ hosted this amazing collection of posters that responded to 9-11 and I made one of those posters and it was at that time that I realized that things were migrating. And then um, this is the catalog for graphic advocacy and the amazing posters. It looked at, at all the man-made and natural disasters that have befallen us in the world. All of my exhibitions have websites that I'm still maintaining. And uh, one co um, colleague from one of the last schools uh, that this traveled to had one of her students hold up all three of my catalogs and she sent this picture to me and I thought it was really cool. So it's in there. My newest exhibition is Women's Rights or Human Rights, International Posters for Gender-Based Inequality, Violence, and Discrimination. Women's Rights or Human Rights was also the title of an important speech given by Hillary Rodham Clinton in 1995 at the United Nations Fourth World Cong uh, Conference on Women in Beijing, in which she said, and I quote, in the, in the term women's rights, if the term women's rights were to be interchangeable with the term human rights, the world community would be a better place because human rights affect women who raise the world's children, care for the elderly, run the companies, work in hospitals, fight for better education and better health care, end quote. So I had begun this about two years ago and I had decided I had been traveling all these exhibitions, but this one I thought, I, you know, I, I just want to make this exhibition. It was a much smaller exhibition and I wanted to put it up at my college gallery. And it was at a time when Hillary was running to be the Democratic nominee. She wasn't even nominated yet. And um, it just suited me to just look at this kind of um, iconography and to put this in, in two in front of my students to have a conversation. But as we well know, this whole thing has exploded in the time that I began it to what's going on right now. It opened at Mass Art um, in September. 
And um, it, it's also been um, on display in um, Seoul, South Korea. This is Seoul, South Korea. And even better, in Mexico, when we were there in October 2016, the exhibition was shown on the street where it belonged. I was beyond thrilled. The invaluable experience that I have gained, wait, well, I'm sorry. So this is the cover for women's rights or human rights, the cover of the catalogs and some of the catalog pages. Some amazing, amazing work out there. And most interestingly, while I was curating this, I was getting some of the best work from advertising agencies, which was different from my other exhibitions. The invaluable experience I have gained in working on these seven exhibition projects has continued to affirm my belief that graphic design is an important artistic and cultural form that should be made accessible to students, our professional communities, and to the public who all benefit by exposure to all forms of creative expression. Providing students with the opportunity to experience making a meaningful, positive contribution to society through graphic design empowers them to play a role, an active role, in improving the way they live, interact, and communicate with one another. As I have been profoundly influenced and, in, and inspired by the times in which I came of age, I am ever hopeful that these experiences will have a profound and meaningful effect on our students today and in the future. Thank you. Surely there's some questions. <laughs> I bombarded you with this, <laughs> my mini manifesto. <laughs> None. I see some people talking. No? So. Actually, I have a question. Okay, yeah. Um, here, let's get to this. Uh, I'm not sure if this is so much of a question. Uh, I'm just curious, what, what do you think about uh, in a world where bad actors um, are getting more sophisticated about using the tools of design to uh, spread poisonous messages? I mean, obviously. There's no way to fight that, per se, but do you have an opinion about that? Well, you know, so we all have messages, and some messages we agree with, and some we might not agree with. And the whole premise of living in this country is that we should have free speech. I bet not free hate speech. There has to be a line but that we have free speech, and that the tools of production are now in the hands of everyone. And if you think about that, that's a really great thing, that anyone who has anything to say, hopefully meaningful, clearly Eileen left, right? Let's just state it there, the big elephant in the room, um, that they should have the right to have their say about things. And I want to just um, make a, a, a little a side note. Um, Stephen Heller, does everybody know who Stephen Heller is? You know, the Book of the Month Club, amazing human being. He uh, writes a lot of design books. And Stephen has always been a great supporter of my work. And he's written a lot of essays in these book, in my catalogs. I always ask Stephen to write an essay. And in graphic advocacy, he really nailed me with an interview. And this guy asks really hard questions. And basically, one of the questions he asked me was, Liz, if someone made an effective poster for pro or anti-abortion, am I saying that right? Not pro-choice. I always get this mixed up for some reason. Would you put it in your show? And I found myself saying, absolutely. If it's effective, if it's a piece of garbage, no. 
I, I, in, in, in curating all of my shows, because they're teaching tools to my undergraduates, always, I only put in the best possible metaphoric graphic design that I can find with effective messages. Because as we all know, there's a lot of crap out there. And although the message might be good, if it's really crap, I'm not going to stick it in. I'm sorry, just not going to do it. I'll let somebody else do it. But yes, I think I would, it, as long as it wasn't hateful, as long as it expressed clearly and succinctly and, and well-meaning its point of view, I would. I think that's fair. I think in what's happening in this country, and I don't want to go too much down this. I don't know if you're red or blue or green. I didn't do my research. <laughs> but I clearly come from Massachusetts, so then yay Elizabeth Warren. And that's all I'm going to say. Um, is that everyone should have the right to free expression. I really firmly believe that. So I'll just kind of, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's what came out from it. It's as expected. I think that liberally, we tend to be, uh, we can be hoisted on our own principles. And I think that's the case. Mm -hmm. The only possible answer. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, my question for you is, you know, I loved everything you showed about uh, how designers can affect uh, our our world and and impact social justice. But as you mentioned, you also have to pay the bills. You have to work. Yes, you do. <laughs> you have to work at Hallmark mm -hmm. or wherever. <laughs> you have to work. So, how do you broach the subject with it with an employer that isn't anywhere in that realm, and you want to bring a social justice spin to your work? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I think there can be several different kinds of answers for that. If you're, um, <clears throat> I chose to work for myself. I mean, that's why I showed that early work. So that it was, um, sometimes baby boomers in those days, we used to call it the um, Robin Hood principle, where you'll work for the multi corporations, but then you'll do the nonprofit organizations. And we did a lot of what was called PSAs, public service announcements. Um, and so that was a way of kind of living with ourselves. And, and also, there was a lot of discussion. Um, and Rick, you probably remember some of this, because this was going on at AIGA conferences. I remember one who, the guy who did Joe Camel, and he was defending working for the cigarette companies when he knew it caused cancer and killed people, um, is a lot of designers chose not to work for um, clients whose products were not good for humankind. I'll just leave it at that, between the guns, the drinking, you know, the dry, uh, drinking, um, and the cigarettes. And so, to help answer that, the only way I would know how to answer that question is that um, it would depend on who your boss was and who the clients were that you were servicing, and whether, in fact, there was a way that you could take some of the messaging that the client needed to ha get out there. You know, I mean, they still often need to sell products or services. I mean, that's the bottom line. But to maybe do so in a more effective way that grabs people by the conscious and not just kind of think of them as stupid people that need to get the latest genes. You know what I'm saying? And we see um, whatever we might think about that. We're seeing large multinational corporations, you know, taking um, a particular topic or issue and working their advertising around it so that they're promoting the issue in a good way, but they're also saying, you know, and by the way, buy my shoes. You know, we're seeing a little bit more of that. And um, I'd, I'd much myself rather see that than just pure, unadulterated, just buy this just because you're stupid and you need to have it, and so just go buy it. You, you know what I'm saying? So I think that you have to look at who the client base is. I think you have to be very clever in some ways to try to you have to work harder to think of different ways in which you can deliver those messages. And then if, um, if it's not a right fit, 
you need to find another way of working. And that, I know that's hard. And, and because I teach undergraduates and because I know they come to college and they in, in, incur a lot of debt in order to get this training, this skill set training that we give them, that I always tell my students, yes, indeed, of course, you need to make a living. But then again, think about how you're making your living. And right at the moment, I think we're in a great Base right now because social design is not a fad. I'm really happy to report it is not a fad. And um, it, there are a lot of studios and agencies that are opening up and only doing social design work. And I think we're seeing more and more of them happen. And I'm also seeing lots of MAs open up in social design around our country. So I think that it's unsustainable to continue to go in the direction that we've all been going. And I think that writing is on the wall. And I'm hoping that our younger people can grab the reins and run with it and make it a better place. That's what I truly hope, that they make it a better place for us. And they change the discipline while doing so. Yes. Hi. What's next for you? What's your n new idea? <laughs> well, I'm tired. Um, well, women's rights just opened. And um, where I thought I was just going to kind of have it up at Mass Art or, and a couple of the poster designers, one of which took it to Seoul, one of which took it to Taipei. I expected that. That's OK. Um, I'm getting a lot of requests to exhibit the exhibition, but this one's a little different and a little easier for me, so I'm going to ride this pony for a while. <laughs> it's basically what I'm saying because it's really taking off, and, and I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I just, I just love trolling the internet. I, how do you think I find this stuff? <laughs> Looking for this work. And uh, when I find it, it's like a gold nugget. And then once I find it, I have to figure out or find, because usually it doesn't always come with names. I have to find out who did it. I have to get their email address. And I have to get them to trust me to send me a high resolution digital file of that work and know that I am going to use it for good and not to rip them off and sell it on the internet or whatever is going on. So um, this exhibition was only 60 posters when I opened it up. And for me, that was enough. You know, I was done. But in fact, I was approached by the Warsaw Poster Museum. And they want the exhibition, and they want it doubled in size. So right at the moment, I'm actually adding to this exhibition as I stand here because that opens in April. So I'm kind of a little frazzled right now. But you know, it's an interesting question because after I do every one of these things, I go, OK, that's it. I'm done. And then I, 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 somebody t says something to me. It, this was suggested to me by somebody else. They said, oh, Liz, why don't you do a woman show? And I kind of gave them an eye roll. And then I thought, oh. So I can't say, I don't know until somebody waves something in front of me and I, I just go, oh, that sounds interesting. And then I just take it from there. So I don't know, stay tuned. <laughs> what do you see? What would you like to see? What is needed? Oh, I thought the women's I'd, uh, rights was, um kind of interesting and at the moment that's what we need. So good job. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I just hit the right moment. I was very lucky. Yes. You can't tell me that with the current climate of what's going on politically that there isn't an idea in your head. <laughs> with what I've seen of your work in and know of your history, that has to be in your head about something to do along that lines, I hope. Well, um, so we all know about the Women's March, right? And I understand Denver came out in force, as did Boston. 
I, I, I stayed in Boston. There were a lot of people who went to Washington. That was fabulous. But I thought it was fabulous that a lot of people came out in their cities and they made a big, loud roar. And um, I'm really hoping that this continues. But we've all seen before big hurrahs that have petered out, you know, that may make some inroads and then they peter out for a while. So I'm kind of watching what's going on with the Women's March myself. You know, they're planning more marches and they're planning. Um, there was um, several people, including Elizabeth Warren, um, that was at the Women's March in Boston. And you probably had similar things happening in Denver. And what was being said to, um, although there were lots of men in these things, but primarily to the women, what was being said to them is get into politics. That is what we were hearing. It's great to come out and demonstrate and make those great signs and let your voice be heard. And of course, let your voice be heard at the polling stations as well. But in fact, women, if you really want to affect change, you have to step up and get in the game. So that's um, interesting to me to see whether that actually brings many more women into politics, into their local, their state, and possibly their federal government, and to see if there's more homegrown uh, women who are participating um, so that maybe we can move a little bit forward. And that also, of course, includes every, uh, not only gender, but everyone, every, just everyone should have a voice in this country. I, I firmly and hard, in my heart of hearts, believe that. So. I have a question, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So you've curated, if you don't mind, sorry. Um, you've curated a wide variety of work and in, insofar as, I mean, you've seen, I'm sure, work from across the globe, right? It's, well, what gets posted. <laughs> right, right. And also looking um, at work over the last century, mm -hmm. right? I'm curious if in the last 20 years or so, or even the last 10 years, if you have found work out of a region that is particularly compelling, like a geographical location, um, you know, uh, your, your Dutch design exhibition, you know, there was a lot of fantastic work coming out, at least in you know, my background with architecture, mm. out of little parts of Europe um, during that time frame. So I'm wondering if in Africa or China, or if you're seeing work from a particular geographic location that is uh, particularly engaging. Um, well, um, if I could start with Mike, <laughs> the reason why I do these projects is to learn. I mean, that's, I think that's pretty clear. I mean, in order for me to understand other cultures through the lens of design, you know, which for me is the easiest way to come into it, to look at their visual languages and how they're the, they culturally represent shapes and colors and iconography. It's all very, it's, in, it's a language. It's a visual language. It's all very different. I, I do these things because I learn a lot and then hopefully I can show what I've learned to others. Um, that, peti that actually happened to me when I first began uh, because oh, I take students abroad every year. The Massachusetts College of Art and Design has a short-term study abroad program because our students can't go to Paris for the year or even for the semester because our programs are so intense and so stepped that if you miss a class, you have to wait a whole year. So it adds five years to the program. So you can imagine that does not work at my college. But we have these short-term study abroad programs. And um, in 1990, I did my first one by taking students to London. I had been to London many times before. I love London. I love English culture. And um, I had seen the work of this designer, Russell Mills. And if you've never seen his work, you should go look. And Russell Mills is one of those people who come out of the Royal College of Art in, I think it was illustration. <laughs> 
but in fact, it was very fine art oriented. It was very collagey, with a lot of typography worked in there. Uh, think of Malcolm Garrett, or um, I can't think of all those British people who were so famous who were doing all those record covers back in the 80s and the 90s. But he was clearly at the vanguard of this. And we took graphic designers and illustrators because um, that's what communication design was at MassArt. It was graphic design and illustration. So we would bring these groups of graphic design and illustration students, and we would look for these crossovers for them. And my colleague and I loved the work of Russell Mills. It was being shown. It was being shown in uh, iMagazine and you know international design journals. And we went to Russell Mills' studio, and I. I walked into that room and my jaw hit the ground with just being in his studio and all the things that he surrounded himself with and seeing the actual physical work. So they, they were like collage artworks that would be photographed as illustrations. So they'd be photographed. He does, um, oh, he does a really famous musician. Thank you. <laughs> he and Brian Eno. He does all the work for Brian Eno. And out of my mouth comes, Mass Art has never had a design show because it's run by the fine artists. Just, just keep that in mind. Out of my mouth comes, how would you like a one-man show at Mass Art? He's no fool. He said yes. So my colleague and I went back to the exhibitions committee loaded with our fine arts colleagues who do not believe graphic design is an exhibitable art form. And... That's how I learned how to be subversive. I showed him what looked like paintings. And they said, oh, looks great, Les. <laughs> so what we did in this exhibition, so that was a visual language I had never seen that was coming out of England. Um, so on one wall were these magnificently gorgeous textural dark gorgeous things, and on the other wall were all of these book jackets and record sleeves, and um, they used to do calendars, um, plastered all over the wall of the same images used as commercial art, because that's actually what he was. He was a designer. Um, and everybody in the car, that pride opened the door. And then the other thing happened when um, I made a trip to Japan in 1998. And I made a trip to Japan in 1998 because I had a student who was of Japanese or origin, and she was in my degree project class. And she had um, been studying in the U.S. for quite a few years. And uh, when I asked her what she wanted to do her degree project on, she said, I want to do the study of, of the history of Japanese graphic design. Now, you can understand. OK, I could get that. And then I realized I knew nothing because I was so Western, you know, Euro-focused, like so many of us are. And so that year, I told my husband, we're going to Japan, which we did. And one of the things that I've always done, which I really love to do, is I contact designers in places that I'm going to visit. And I ask to go and visit their studios. And of course, at that time, I was booking AIGA lectures. So I had a kind of little chip there that I could offer to bring them. And um, I looked at the work, and I found the work of Makoto Saito. That completely blew my socks off. It was very, you know, that word avant-garde drives me crazy. But it was really cutting edge. And it was, he too had that painterly aspect to him. But he was doing work that nobody else was doing and that you weren't going to expect of the Japanese at that time. He was kind of breaking all the rules. And I just love that visual language. So um, he had invited me to his studio, and the same thing happened. I took one look at this work, and I was drooling. And I said, how would you like a one-man show at Mass Art? And being the true Japanese he was, he said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> they never say yes right away. It's not done. A week later, he said yes. And um, so I was able to bring that work to mass art, and that was truly. So you know, this, these are ways in which that I learn about different cultures, and you know, how the people who are kind of coming out of these cultures and, and looking for new visual languages. I mean, we have them in the U.S. as well. Every so often, somebody comes out with a new visual language, and then everybody copies it, and then they have to reinvent themselves <laughs> to stay current. So. 
I mean, I find that great fun. But with that said, I did practice for over 20 years. I had great client relationships, and I maintained my own practice, and I loved it. I loved designing. But it came, but and this is what I want to say, especially to the young people in the audience, is that although you might study a particular discipline, and we talked about this, because <laughs> Mike is a, is a good example of that. Even though you, you study a particular discipline, that doesn't mean that necessarily you're going to do that for the rest of your life. In fact, that sounds rather boring to me, especially for creatives. I think that's going to jumpstart you. And then what you need to do is you kind of have to be, you have to be in the moment. You have to see what, what is going on in your world. Like I got swept up into the whole anti-war movement. You know, I mean, I was never political. I was really never, you know, I cared about, what was it, Rick? Eyeliner. I know about that. Eyeliner and mascara. I, you saw the, I showed you those pictures of what I look like. That's what I cared about. But you get swept up into the kind of vortex of this energy, and you're, and you're, you're challenged to start thinking about things in different ways. And if you're smart enough, you'll listen to your inner gut, and you'll go with it. And you'll go and you'll take that pathway and you'll take it and you'll know that, you know, designers are really quite well trained. We, we, we land on our feet and that we don't necessarily have to be working with clients for the rest of our lives unless we want to. That there are, I, I would have never considered, okay, so I'm a child of the 50s and my mother said, oh, Liz, you know, besides becoming a family, you know, having a family, of course she wanted me to have a family. I think that would be nice if you had a career. She did not, of course, have one. And so she said, well, you could be a nurse. You could be a school teacher. You could be, uh, she was a secretary later on. You could be a secretary. And somehow none of that resonated. She never said to me, I never knew this until the day I walked into an adult classroom. She never said to me, you could be a university professor because women were not. Yes. Yeah. University. So she never put that in my brain. She only put those three things in. I faint at the sight of blood, so forget the nurse. I purposely did not learn how to type and still don't know how to type. My fingers go across the keyboard in all weird ways. I never learned how to type. I did that on purpose. And um, I love my children, and I was so happy to be a mother, but I hate little kids. So I'm not going to be a school teacher. It's not my thing. But when I started to work with college students, I mean, I just lit up. This made so much sense to me. But I, nobody prepared me for that. Nobody told me about that. Nobody suggested that to me, ever. I just kind of took a job in an adult ed class, you know, the ones they have in high school. And I went, oh, this is interesting. Because designers are taught, are taught to be communicators. And as a part of that, we are able to articulate ideas. And so to be able to articulate what I had already learned to others actually came more naturally than I would have thought about. So, you know, when that started to happen, and then, of course, I had to write curriculum. When I first started um, teaching, and I'll be really straightforward with you, when I first started teaching, most of the instructors were graphic designers who were teaching part-time. And they would decide what they were going to assign their students on the way into the classroom. There were no curriculums or syllabi or syllabuses or assessments, which is what's going on now. And they would actually give client projects what they were working on now, because that's what was in their mind. I mean, it was really poorly done. I mean, that's what it was. And so I found myself, I saw that happening, and it didn't make any sense to me at all. I, I'm very methodical. I need a stepped approach when I'm teaching. And so I had developed that curriculum that was in that little black book that was kind of a stepped approach. It was not what I was doing for clients. It was trying to teach them visual language strategies, how to use visual language. It's a grammar. And um, I found that I, that's design. 
That's design. And I liked doing design in that way as well. I like doing design in many different ways. And as you can see, I have many different enthusiasms. And all of you can have many different enthusiasms to the kind of work that you do, or um, many of the projects that you've seen, I'm, I'm, I'm not paid for. I'm a faculty curator. It's part of service. I am not paid for these things. I do them because I'm, I want to learn, and I want to show my students what I have learned. And that's my way to do it. It's support, the costs of the, of the exhibitions are supported by my college, but I am not paid anything other than my salary to do that. So that's important to know. Books, academic books, I don't think so. You don't even make a penny an hour, <laughs> right, Peter? No, especially acad academic publishers do not give advances, per se. You do all this work because you're driven to do it. And if it sells, maybe you'll make a couple of cents. Unless it's a bestseller, you're not going to see any, any major amounts of money. So they're passion projects. But I can do the passion projects as a full-time educator. That's a harder thing to do when you're a full-time designer because your income comes from your client work for the most part. And although all designers have passion projects. Of course you have passion projects. Maybe not on the level of putting these books together. These books take usually several years to put together. Can we use that as a segue to give two of them away? Oh, good, good. <laughs> Thank you for your kindness in listening to me. 